commercial aviation is often a zero-sum game. Very rarely does a big aircraft order leave all sides satisfied. When the stakes are this high, they're almost always winners and losers. But just a few weeks ago, something remarkable happened. Air India placed an order so big and worth so much money that nearly everyone walked away happy. Both Boeing and Airbus secured orders for hundreds of new jets, adding over $50 billion to each company's books. Suffice it to say, this was a day of celebration for all sides. But despite the momentous occasion, there was one party who was left on the outside looking in. That would be Embraer, the Brazilian jet maker. Despite its long legacy of building reliable, efficient jets, it's been struggling as of late. This has been punctuated by stagnant sales of its flagship E-2 jet, which missed out on the Air India order bonanza. Now, the E-2 is a modern marvel, and it boasts significant improvements over its predecessors. And yet, the program has flatlined. So, what's going on here? Why isn't anyone buying Embraer jets? And is there anything Embraer can do to right the ship? Let me explain. Now, before hopping into the video, some of you might know I just started doing YouTube full time. But when this was still just a hobby, my days were jam packed. I was working upwards of 16 hour days split between my job and the channel, and I had very little free time. Because of that, I was ordering a lot of takeout, which was both expensive and bad for my waistline. But then I tried HelloFresh, today's sponsor. HelloFresh sends pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes straight to your door. That way, you can make delicious home-cooked meals without spending excess time doing grocery shopping or meal prepping. And the stuff they send you is really great. You can choose from up to 40 different recipes a week, and those recipes can be customized to fit any diet. Plus, the ingredients travel straight from the farm to your home in less than 7 days, so you know it's always fresh. The best part is that HelloFresh is actually affordable, and for a limited time, my viewers can earn an additional 65% off their HelloFresh order, plus get free shipping. Simply go to HelloFresh.com and use the promo code EXPLAINS65 to do so. First, let's talk about what's new on the Embraer E2. It's the successor to the wildly popular E-Jet and improves upon its design in several key ways. It boasts a new wing to generate more lift, a smaller horizontal stabilizer to reduce drag, and fly-by-wire controls to reduce weight. But by far the biggest change has been to its engines. It sports gigantic Pratt & Whitney PW1900s, which have a fan diameter of 73 inches. That's actually 4 inches bigger than what's found on the 737 MAX, a plane that's nearly twice as big. Their sheer size helps to increase the bypass ratio and decrease fuel burn. And coupled with the E2's other improvements, they make the jet up to 24% more efficient than its predecessor. But despite all of these updates, the E2 has really struggled to sell. The program launched almost exactly a decade ago, but across its three distinct variants, it's only managed to secure orders for a measly 255 units during that time. To add insult to injury, the E-175 E-2, the smallest E-2 variant, hasn't corralled a single firm order. This seems odd. After all, the original E-Jet sold like hotcakes, and the E-2 is its most logical successor. And yet, we're still faced with a substantial gap in orders. So. What gives? Well, to understand what's really going on here, we need to find out who the biggest E-Jet customers are and why they aren't buying the E-2. Today, over 25% of all E-Jets fly for American regional carriers. Now, the way that regional flying works in the US is kind of weird. Big airlines like Delta, United, and American contract out their regional operations to smaller carriers, including the likes of Republic, SkyWest, Envoy, and Mesa Airlines. Combined, these four regionals fly a total of 505 E-Jets, and nearly all of them are of the E-175 variety, the predecessor to the E-175 E-2. So how many E-175 E-2s have these stalwart customers ordered? So far, zero. 
You see, in order to fly on behalf of America's Big Three, the regional carriers must abide by something called a scope clause. The scope clause limits the size of jet that these airlines can fly. As it stands today, they're limited to operating planes that have no more than 76 seats and an MTO of 86,000 pounds. Now, remember those giant fuel-efficient engines that Embraer stuck on the E2? Well, they certainly help make the plane more efficient, but they also make the plane heavier. The E-175E2 has an MTO just shy of 99,000 pounds, well above what's permitted by the scope clause. So long as the clause goes unchanged, the regionals won't be allowed to fly the jet. And I know this is going to come as a real shock, but none of them want to buy a plane that they aren't allowed to use. It's no wonder then that the E-175E2 hasn't won a single order. Now, the good news for Embraer is that the scope clause does get reviewed and renewed periodically, so this MTO limit could get raised. But exactly when that'll actually happen remains foggy, and it doesn't seem like it'll be anytime soon. You see, the regionals fly e-jets that are actually fairly young. Most of them simply aren't ready to be retired, so there isn't a strong incentive to push for a change. But even if the regionals wanted the E2 right now, changing the scope clause wouldn't be a walk in the park. That's because it's explicitly designed to protect pilots. Today, we're in the midst of a major pilot shortage, and Delta, United, and American are paying more and more for their services. Now, the regional airlines typically hire younger pilots, and they can get away with paying them less. As such, the mainliners would absolutely love to outsource more of their flights to these regional partners in order to help save a buck. But the scope clause essentially prevents this from happening. Since the regionals can only fly small jets, it would mean the airlines would be sacrificing capacity on denser mainline routes. This isn't a worthwhile trade-off, so the mainline pilots end up keeping their jobs. Ultimately, whenever the regionals push to modify the clause, they'll have to go through the venerable pilots' unions to do so. All in all, this situation helps explain why the E-175E2 has garnered zero orders thus far. But what about the E-190 and E-195E2, the other E-2 variants? The US regionals have never and likely will never fly planes of this size, and thus they have no impact on their sluggish sales. So why aren't they selling well either? Well, if you ask Embraer, they're sure to pin it on Boeing. In 2019, Boeing and Embraer agreed to enter into a joint venture, under which Boeing would take an 80% stake in Embraer's commercial business. As the deal was being worked out, prospective E2 customers put their orders on pause. They wanted to see how everything played out before buying the jet. Well, by mid-2020, Boeing withdrew from the deal. And when this happened, all of those potential customers got cold feet. Embraer contends that, if Boeing had never pulled out, the E2 would be selling better. Now, there is certainly some merit to this argument, but it ultimately distracts from the biggest problem with the E2. In truth, the plane isn't selling because it suffers from poor product market fit. In recent years, we've seen a complete shift in how airlines conduct business. While narrowbodies were once confined to short hops, they're now being asked to do much, much more. Today, it's not uncommon to find 737s and A320s flying on journeys that last six hours or more, and this would have been completely unheard of a couple decades ago. It's abundantly clear that the narrowbody landscape has changed significantly since the E-Jet was first launched in the mid-90s, and unfortunately, the E-2 just hasn't kept up with the times it really doesn't add that much versatility over its predecessor. Sure, it's more efficient, but the missions it flies are largely the same. This stands in stark contrast with the Airbus A220, the E2's biggest rival. That plane has completely rewritten the book on regional travel, so much so that it's kind of hard to call the A220 a pure regional jet. It can fly up to 1,000 nautical miles further than the E2, despite holding a similar number of seats. It also sports a wider cabin, which makes it better equipped to fly longer routes more comfortably. Coupled with remarkable operating economics, the A220 is proving to be a Swiss army knife of a plane, something the E2 isn't. Let me give you some examples of how this is actually playing out in the wild. Right now, airlines are using the A220 to fly routes like San Diego to Montreal and Riga to Dubai. These routes are thin, they don't draw a ton of passengers, and are perfectly suited for the size of a regional jet. 
However, they are so far apart, up to six hours by air, that most regional jets simply can't make the journey. But the A220 can, which unlocks a whole new revenue stream for airlines. As a result, historical EJet operators like JetBlue and Air Canada are defecting from Embraer and buying the A220 instead. In addition, new entrants to the regional jet market, like Breeze and Air Baltic, have gone with the Airbus as well. The upshot is that the A220s outsold the E2 by a count of 3 to 1, and it's expected that this gap will grow. So how does Embraer right the ship? Where does it go from here? Well, candidly, there is no quick fix. As far as the E-175-E2 goes, it remains at the mercy of the scope clause. Now, Embraer remains confident that that clause will eventually get changed, and they actually pushed back the plane's entry into service from 2021 to 2027. So for now at least, they seem content to simply ride it out until an amendment is made. Meanwhile, the E-190 and 195E2 are in a trickier position. Embraer could still try to develop an ER version of each jet to give it more parity with the A220, but that'll be expensive. Alternatively, Embraer can try to exploit the E2's cost advantage. The E-195E2 has a list price that's 50% less than the A22300. If Embraer can get even more aggressive on pricing, it could convince more customers to come through the door. One final Hail Mary that Embraer could try is selling its commercial business to Boeing. Now, if you're experiencing deja vu, it's not just you. Yeah, Embraer already tried to do this and it didn't work out. But Boeing might have renewed interest in exploring a deal. That's something I'm going to cover in detail in an upcoming video, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. At the end of the day, this situation shows exactly why airplane makers take years and years to evaluate, analyze, and refine their commercial designs before ever offering them to customers. If they get it wrong, it could impact their business for a very long time. Unfortunately, this is exactly what's happened to Embraer. While the E-2 is an advanced jet and a significant improvement over its predecessor, it isn't the right jet for the current market. Hopefully, Embraer figures out a way to get the E-2 back on track, but doing so could be a tall task. So, what do you guys think Embraer should do? Do you see any other solutions that I might be missing here? Also, have you ever flown on the E-2? Embraer talks a lot about how much it's improved its cabin, but based on the pictures I've seen, they really don't look all that different. If you've flown it, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you so much to my patrons for helping to make this video possible. If you like what I do and want to help the channel grow, go ahead and check out this link right here. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.